Hello, my name is Daniele Malafarina. I'm a professor at Nazarbayev University and in the next uh, 20 minutes or so I would like to talk to you about physics and in particular about a Bachelor of Science in the Physics Department of Nazarbayev University. So first of all let me take you on a little um, excursion about physicists and what physicists do. Uh, you may have some idea and you probably know that these people here, Isaac Newton, Albert Einstein, which you can see in the picture when he was younger, we always see pictures of Einstein at an older age, uh, James Clerk, Maxwell, Ludwig Boltzmann, Schrödinger, Bohr, and Stephen Hawking, they're all very famous physicists. They're scientists, they gave great contribution to our understanding of the, of the fundamental laws of nature that govern the universe, and so they became sort of famous as scientists. And this is the idea that people have about the physicist in general. It is a guy that sits there, looks at the universe, try to understand how the universe works. This is true to a certain extent, but this is not uh, the only uh, case. These are the people you may not know. They're also physicists. Um, I was surprised to discover, for example, of uh, this woman, Guljan uh, Moldajanova, that was number 37 on Forbes' list of most powerful women in the world in 2008. She's a physicist. Jimmy Carter, former US President, and Angela Merkel, uh, Chancellor of Germany, politicians, they're all physicists. But also Brian May, a uh, guitarist of Queen, that uh, you probably heard of, the band of Freddie Mercury, that was fairly famous in the 80s and the 90s, is an astrophysicist. And the fact that he was a world-famous rock star never stopped him from actually keep on being an astrophysicist. So when the European Space Agency landed uh, a, a spacecraft on one comet, the so-called Rosetta mission, he was one of the people that participated in constructing, designing, and achieving this incredible goal of landing uh, a spacecraft on a comet. And other people, uh, Elon Musk, everybody knows Elon Musk, but also the first rocket builders, uh, co-founders of Intel, pioneers in electronic music. So physicists, they do tend to spread uh, in different fields and in different domains. And this is thanks to their ability to be problem solvers and to uh, understand problems in terms of what is essential for the solution. So now let me just talk for a few minutes about how physics works and how it plays in our everyday life. So we go to gravity because it's a force that everybody's familiar with, everybody has fallen uh, on the ground sometimes or played with the ball, so everybody experiences gravity, but not everybody stops to think about how gravity works. So this is what Newton did, uh, for example, and he came out with his famous uh, law of the inverse uh, square of the distance that determines how bodies fall on Earth and also how planets orbit the Sun and how to put satellites in orbit. Newton was interested into understanding the force of gravity, so he was that kind of thinker that looks outside the window and tries to figure out how the universe uh, works. But uh, in doing so, he gave us tools, mathematical tools, that allow us to uh, construct technology. And this is an important evolutionary advantage for the society or for the species that actually possesses it. So for several centuries, the study in gravity, uh, for example, gave a big advantage uh, to who understood how gravity works over who didn't. Think about the military. If you have to shoot down uh, a ship in an arbor or, uh, or uh, the defenses of a castle or something, if you're able to calculate exactly where your cannonballs will land, that will give you the advantage over your opponent that is trying to guess where it might land, but it has to shoot several times before it actually gets the right distance. So knowing the laws of gravity gave an advantage to the society that was able uh, to use those. And uh, then we didn't stop there, of course. Uh, after a few centuries, people kept on thinking about gravity in terms of uh, 
uh, fundamental laws of nature. So Einstein came along, who wasn't so much interested into the military application of cannonballs and so on, but still was interested into understanding what is inertia, what are masses, what is gravity. And he came up with his theory of general relativity, and some of the consequences of the theory of general relativity was uh, regions that are so dense so that and so massive that not even light can escape from those. Those regions we call black holes. And at first, there were a sort of curiosity, something that the theory predicts, but people did not really believe that they do exist uh, in nature. Then people started uh, actually observing phenomena in the universe that had to be described by uh, the laws that Einstein devised. And today, we do know that actually black holes exist. They are the product of very massive stars that collapse under their own gravity. So on the left here, you see a computer simulation of how a black hole would look, and that was made for the movie Interstellar. And on the right, we see the very famous first image of a black hole that was taken by the Event Horizon uh, Telescope. So this may seem kind of uh, far-fetched, um, because it has no actual application in our everyday life. These are stars that died millions of years ago at uh, very, very uh, large distances from Earth. But to prove that black holes exist, scientists had to come up with a mechanism to detect their existence. And you cannot see them. There is uh, no light coming out of them uh, unless there is gas surrounding them. So calculations showed that black holes uh, when they collide, when two black holes smash onto each other, produce these so-called gravitational waves, in the same way that electromagnetic waves are uh, like light propagate the electromagnetic field, gravitational waves propagate the gravitational field. And the hunt was on to actually discover these gravitational waves, detect them. And that was an enormous uh, experimental challenge. It took several decades and several uh, scientists all over the world to come up with a kind of experiment that was able to actually show that gravitational waves exist and black holes do produce them. Um, for example, the first detection of gravitational waves occurred in 2015, so a hundred years after Einstein formulated the theory. And to detect that, scientists had to come up with an interferometer, which you can see a picture here on the right, which is a device that uh, basically bounces a laser back and forth and creates interference pattern that is perturbed a little bit by a factor 10 to the minus 20 when the gravitational wave passes. And the instruments were so precise that we were able to detect this very tiny uh, movement of the mirrors that are bouncing the laser. To give you an idea, 10 to the minus 20 is like measuring the distance between the Sun and the nearest star, Alpha Centauri, that is around four light years away uh, from us, with the precision of the thickness of one hair. So it's an incredible achievement that scientists were able to actually detect gravitational waves like this. And in order to do that, they had to come up with lots of new technology. So this new technology, which was developed for uh, these experiments eventually ends up in our everyday life. I'm not going to talk about uh, actual technological advancements, but this is what happens with physics all the time. The technology that is uh, devised to make experiments and discover something new about the universe eventually ends up in our everyday lives. You're using one of those right now because the internet was uh, devised by scientists, physicists at uh, CERN in Geneva in order to be able to share data on particle collisions at the accelerator all over the world. And then it didn't stay there, slowly it went out and now everybody's using the internet and nobody remembers that it was made by physicists for their own purposes. The discovery of uh, gravitational waves granted those smart people a Nobel Prize, even though the people that were involved were actually thousands and thousands. But that's not the only thing. The theory that Einstein devised 100 years ago and that we have proven today that is correct and we have shown that the black holes exist is also used in your phone. Today, when you go around and you open Google Maps or Yandex Maps and to see where you are 
and you need to know with the precision of a few meters where you are, otherwise the taxi that you're calling will not uh, find you, you're using Einstein's theory. If we use Newton's theory only with the GPS, the error margins would grow over a few hours and the, the precision on your location on the map would be not accurate enough for any purposes within uh, a few hours. So the equations that Einstein devised 100 years ago that brought us more understanding about gravity and new uh, concepts like black holes, now we need to use in our everyday life in the smartphones in order to locate ourselves on the map. And this is what physics does all the time. It advances our knowledge of the universe, it advances how we understand phenomena in the universe, so that eventually this understanding will give us new technology and a different uh, way of life, and it will impact our life on an everyday basis. Now let me spend a couple of minutes about us. As a physics department, there's 12 uh, faculty members, we have one instructor, postdocs, PhDs, so we are covering all the range uh, teaching assistants, lab assistants, and we are very much engaged into um, research and the teaching. So even at the undergraduate level, lots of our students, the, the best and the smartest students, they are involved into research from the very from the very beginning, I would say from the second year or third year, so that they are exposed to an environment in which not only you learn things, but also you understand how to come up with new ideas, new tools, and better models for the, the systems that you're trying to, to study. And we cover research areas all around the spectrum of physics, from experimental to theoretical, from very fundamental like uh, general relativity and quantum mechanics, to very applied like uh, laser, metamaterial, uh, photonics, and so on. Uh, uh, high energy physics in accelerator and high energy astrophysics, and uh, nonlinear dynamics and uh, semiconductors and so on. So we cover all possible broad areas. And students are exposed to uh, labs from very early on. Uh, we have some state-of-the-art facilities in which uh, we do research and in which students can actually take part. Uh, also worth to mention that we are connected with uh, two uh, separate institutes that are based here with us, the Energetic Cosmos Laboratory, which is an institute for astrophysics that studies the mysteries of the universe that uh, um, involve uh, fancy uh, names like dark energy, dark matter, and gamma ray bursts, and the particle accelerator uh, in URA that is a uh, newly uh, opened accelerator that was developed in collaboration with Tomsk uh, University and uh, the Berkeley National Laboratory in in US. So we have state-of-the-art facilities, we have um, good uh, faculty professors doing interesting research all over the spectrum, and we have collaborations with different institutions all over the world. So our good students, when they develop research projects, we send them around to maybe uh, further collaborations. And here you can see, uh, rather than a list of names, a bunch of pictures, as you can tell, Physicists are not the best at taking pictures, but they're good at, uh, at other things. So South Korea, United States, uh, Cambridge in the US, MIT, Princeton. So we have sent our students for internships to some of the best places uh, in the world. And we got pictures in return. Also, uh, worth to mention that uh, uh, some of our students, uh, they continue, most of our students actually, they continue their studies. If you want, uh, after you finish a bachelor degree, you can uh, get jobs in different uh, uh, fields in uh, Kazakhstan, from the finance sector to research and development, to government, uh, space agency, and so on. But a lot of students, they choose to continue with the master's or with the PhD, so you can see a little video of a graduation ceremony, and there's myself with some of our students that graduated in 2017, and that today they are at uh, universities around the world pursuing uh, their master's or PhD. So, and we send our students in some of the best universities, Wisconsin Medicine, University of Michigan, MIT, uh, John Hopkins that became famous uh, lately because they produced all those plots about the coronavirus, 
and uh, and so on. Um, okay, so uh, here there's a couple of words about bachelor in physics. It takes uh, four years, and as I said before, we are uh, involved in te teaching through research, so the students are exposed uh, to uh, research very early on in their uh, studies, and also um, learn all around uh, the topics that are going from the fundamental topics in physics, like, for example, classical mechanics, quantum mechanics, and all those things that everybody has to learn in order to call themselves a physicist, but also uh, topics that are closer to uh, our modern life, where like quantum technology and, and uh, entrepreneurship and topics that are related to how to apply this knowledge in our everyday world, in our changing technological society. So briefly here, uh, you will have a core curriculum that is courses that everybody's taking at uh, as the School of Science and Humanities uh, throughout the uh, and different uh, fields. Then there are the physics core courses, and then there are a bunch of courses you can choose electives of different types, general electives that are very broad, or major electives that are electives that are specific to your uh, course. Here, uh, briefly, you can actually see, but uh, there's no really point uh, spending too much time on which actual courses you will do. This is the core curriculum. Physics courses in the core curriculum include uh, Physics 1, that everybody has to do, and Calculus uh, for Mathematics. And then here are the Physics uh, core courses that are the ones that every physicist has to know in order uh, to actually call himself a physicist. And you can see at the bottom there is a bunch of math courses because Physics is very much rooted into Mathematics. So Classical Mechanics, uh, Quantum Mechanics, Electrodynamics, uh, Thermodynamics and Statistics. So and computational physics, because today, without uh, computational skills, it's very difficult to go anywhere. And here it's a list of the potential uh, electives. The 200 level, like introductory astronomy and quantum technologies, are the broad ones that are uh, uh, electives or general electives. And the 400 levels are the more uh, research-oriented uh, courses. And as you can see, some of those are called designated research course. Because besides learning, besides giving the exams, if you want to get a degree, that's enough. But for some uh, students, you may also have a possibility of taking a honors track. And the honors track basically gives you a better chance of admission into a master or a PhD program abroad. And it's more designed for those people that are interested into research. So the honors track is uh, it's finalized essentially with a research thesis towards the end. And so there are research courses that one has to take and then do some actual, uh, produce some actual result in research and, and uh, have a research thesis. This is separated so that if one only wants to get a degree in physics and uh, graduate and get a job, doesn't have to do the thesis and doesn't have to take uh, this track uh, necessarily. Very broadly, uh, here is uh, an example of how the... Uh, four years would look. First and second year are here. Lots of math and general courses in the first year. Second year, more math, and you start to go more deep into physics. And then in the third and fourth year, you focus mostly on uh, the physics, uh, more advanced uh, um, courses. And as you can see, in the fourth year, there's lots of electives. So that's the time where you have the most choice on choosing what to, what to study. Now, the last couple of words about uh, what it means to be a physicist, actually. Let's go back here, what it means to be a physicist. Because um, being a physicist is a complex <laughs> system of many things coming together. You look at this animation here, there's two balls moving, one seems to move in, move in a very predictable way, and another one seems to move in a very uh, strange and chaotic way. And so from this, I can understand that there's a pattern behind it, and they actually come from very simple systems. One is a simple pendulum, and the other one is a double pendulum. And the double pendulum, when you actually look at it, it's a very simple system to, uh, to describe, to prepare, but then when it evolves, it's extremely complex. It's very difficult to predict. It's actually one of those systems that are called uh, chaotic. It has deterministic chaos in the sense that slight departure from the initial conditions lead to completely different outcomes after a certain amount of time. So 
what is my job as a physicist? I don't care about what it is made of. I don't care about the wood and the ball, what is made that. What I care about is its motion. I care about how it evolves over time. And even a simple system that evolves in such a complex behavior has simple equations to describe it. So writing the equations that describe how this thing moves, it's relatively simple. Then solving them and seeing how it evolves, it's not so simple. Here you can see in this bit of the animation that if I slightly change the initial conditions, after a very short time, the system is very chaotic. All the, the balls that were basically uh, very close to each other at the beginning, after a very short time, they go to completely different path. And it's very difficult to uh, predict where it will go if I don't have an extreme precision in the measurement of the initial conditions. So this is interesting for the, this kind of uh, pendulum, but you would say, okay, why would this be useful at something it's somewhere in everyday life? So let's now take another um, chaotic uh, system called the uh, uh, water wheel. That is basically a wheel in which you have buckets from which water can enter and can exit and it can spin. This is another system that has the uh, same kind of uh, chaotic behavior, same kind of uh, dependence uh, on the initial data that is very close. And you can write very simply the equations that describe this, uh, this system. Writing the equations is easy. This is, takes, uh, if you want to simplify everything, it's basically a set of three equations. But then these equations are very sensitive to the initial data. If I take, take two very close initial data, they will go uh, in very different direction in a very short time. This is the very famous uh, butterfly effect. It's called butterfly effect because the phase space that describes this system looks like a butterfly. You may uh, describe the system basically with a few numbers, and these numbers you can plot them on axes. There should be three axes, and you can see here how the plot evolves, and you can see that the system evolves moving around two regions that are, let's say, two attractors for the evolution of the system, but the system never reaches those regions the, at the center of these things, and keep on going back and forth between one side and the other. So the plot of the phase space looks like a butterfly, and so that's the name of the butterfly effect. But there's another reason for that, and that is that the very same equation that describe this system, they used in meteorology. If I want to predict the weather, the equations are essentially exactly the same. So the very uh, nice analogy of the idea that uh, butterfly, uh, the wings cause a tiny perturbation in the initial conditions of the butterfly in uh, Hong Kong, and that will cause a storm in Los Angeles. That is, tiny, sense, tiny uh, differences in the initial conditions will cause large differences in uh, the system at a later time. And here you can see the two water wheels that started with almost the same initial conditions. After a little bit, they go in completely different direction. One is going to the right, one is going to the left. So even though the initial conditions were extremely si similar, very, very close, after a short time, the system evolves in a completely different way. One had the butterfly wings, and the other one didn't have the butterfly wings. And so that's why predicting the weather is so difficult, because the equations are the same as here. And if you don't have the initial conditions very precise for all, then uh, it's very difficult to predict what will happen in, uh, in the future. So what I care about here is the equations, is what matters into predicting the evolution of the system, what doesn't matter I neglect, what matters I follow, and this then I apply to weather, traffic, or other systems that exhibit the same equations, the same dynamical behavior, even though they're actually made of completely different, different things. So this is the job of a physicist. See the patterns behind uh, events. See the patterns behind phenomena. Recognize what is important to describe the phenomena and what is irrelevant to the phenomena then narrow it down to the basic laws that describe how this phenomenon evolve, and then see whether I can apply these laws to other domains. And then you end up finding physicists working in the financial sector and the stock market, in uh, uh, mining and, uh, 
uh, drilling, in uh, uh, biology, in the evolution of uh, uh, biological systems, uh, or at the head of companies, because we're able to understand what matters to understand the future evolution of the system and what doesn't matter, and we're able to see the patterns that are behind the actual uh, phenomena itself. So with this, I think I'm going to close. I hope this was interesting for you. You see here a bunch of graduates all together with uh, uh, former uh, president of Kazakhstan. Some of these guys are from physics, some others are from other schools. This is our beautiful University of Nazarbayev University. And so I hope that I will see you joining the physics department at Nazarbayev University in the near future. And with this, I thank you and goodbye.